Shall we begin then? Uh, my name is Harold Nelson, and uh, I'm going to be the uh, guide and navigator uh, for this uh, master class and for several subsequent master classes in um, uh, systemic design. Uh, if you need or would like to have more information on my background and uh, resources that I've collected over time, um, I invite you to visit my website, www.heraldgnelson.com, and um, there's a lot more material there and links to articles, videos, books, etc. So, uh, as an introduction to the classes uh, and to their structure and uh, process, the design of the classes are systemic and they're inclusive, multi-layered, and are not comprehensive. That means that um, they're introductory and uh, that they're non-reductive, synthetic as well as an analytic, that um, they're very broad and inclusive and uh, have a, a deep and complex approach. Um, the success of the uh, course depends as much upon your state of reception as it does on uh, uh, the content of the course itself. So this is an example of kind of introductory piece about uh, the different states of listening we can be in whenever we're introduced to new information. And the norm, uh, the one that uh, we're typically in, is that we're listening for something that affirms what we already know. So it's reconfirming to us and it's familiar. If we want to learn something new and we want to uh, uh, sort of be open to uh, uh, new ideas, we want to uh, be at another state that would be, for instance, critical, would be disconfirming to what we already know and we can further open up to where we're um, actually listening for the other, about the other, and on behalf of the other. Anyway, this is just um, a, a sort of introduction to the notion that we can imagine ourselves to be in these different states of listening, and the success of what we learn or what we hear depends as much on the state that uh, we're in actually, and uh, as much as it is what the content of the material is. So you're a major part of this whole presentation. It's not just me, just the course itself. So, presently, there's a lot of uh, time and energy being spent uh, escaping issues, problems, threats, etc. in today's world, uh, but we're not spending enough time uh, creating desired futures that we want to see be made real. So, if we're going to change this, how do, how do we approach um, that kind of a change, a major change? And one of the ways is by thinking different and, of course, by design. So uh, the intention of the uh, courses and uh, master classes is to explore how to establish a place where we can begin to uh, explore the nature and the challenges of systemic design and uh, how we can. Uh, sort of begin to um, think about how we can learn, get better at being systemic designers, how we can understand uh, what systemic design is about, and how we understand how we work together um, to come to common understandings and, and uh, build common backgrounds in it.
So part of the common background is to understand um, uh, in this shared space uh, that we're going to build for having a conversation about systemic design is uh, to uh, talk about and, uh, and discuss uh, what systemic design has been, what it is, what it can be, what we desire it to be, and um, these classes, the master classes, are meant to be catalysts for uh, helping to form a common platform then uh, that will uh, give us a place and a space for our conversations that we have together, collective conversations, around the nature of systemic designing and uh, how it's applied, how we can practice uh, systemic designing. So this course and the subsequent master uh, classes are going to be introducing um, ideas and, and concepts that are going to be part of the conversational mix that we have uh, together uh, when we're talking about uh, designers and uh, systemic designing. It's, they're going to be a part of the mix. They are not the whole mix. They're just going to be uh, contributions to the conversation and they're not uh, meant to be by any means the uh, sort of bottom line answers to any questions that uh, there may be about what systemic designers uh, do and um, how they become systemic designers, what systemic design praxis is like. It's just meant, these courses are just meant to become a part of the mix, to present uh, just an aspect of some of the background and uh, uh, sort of common ground that uh, the conversations will be based on. So, the conversations that we'll have and um, the ideas that are going to be presented in part is going to be, because they're systemic, uh, they're going to be part uh, uh, about what, how we see complexity, how we can look at things um, ideas, concepts, realities that are quite complex. But the thing about complexity is that we cannot see it from one position, one station point, one uh, sort of visual perspective. And what we do get is maybe glimpses of parts of the complexity. And this sort of plays off the idea of uh, Plato and his shadows on the wall in a cave where um, the people in the cave can't see outside, but they see the shadows cast on the walls of the cave, cave of the exterior world. And so in a way, this is uh, just saying that how we're, going to, we're not going to be able to observe any complete concept, idea, approach in its totality from any one place, any one perspective. Uh, from any one viewpoint. It's that we have to walk around through and see all the different uh, uh, aspects of the ideas that we're going to be uh, uh, working with and to be able to begin to comprehend how all of these parts begin to f feed one another and uh, become more of a composition, a holistic composition taken together but we're not going to be presenting, I'm not going to be presenting uh, ideas and concepts that give you the whole picture just from one uh, perspective or one viewpoint. So why it's time. We've uh, been sort of uh, through some traumatic changes uh, in the last few years and some even before that, but certainly the uh, last few years have challenged a lot of the norms that we've held and a lot of the norms have changed. Some of them had to change. Um, it's been a good idea 
uh, to sort of begin to build new uh, norms. And uh, part of that is to begin to look at um, the world and our uh, interaction with the world more as uh, designers, especially as systemic designers. So the reason is that um, the way we've been doing things, the way we've been thinking about the world, the way we've been thinking about change and intervention um, isn't working so well. And the expectations that people have uh, of professionals, particularly designers, systemic designers, is that we're going to do better and we need to do better. So this is one of the major reasons now that we really need to begin to look at uh, systemic design uh, with fresh eyes and that uh, by collectively having these uh, conversations together, looking into uh, ideas and building on one another's notions that we can uh, get a much better understanding of what we can do, what we should do, and how we can do it. So the idea um, for these uh, conversations is sort of a follow-on to um, uh, my experience, other people's experiences with something that I call uh, the Berkeley bubble. And uh, from the early um, 1960s, continuing into the 1980s, uh, there was an aggregation of exceptional scholars and professionals um, that formed in the University of California, Berkeley um, environs and they established a common bond amongst themselves and with other networks of uh, scholars, students, and professionals globally. Um, they were uh, not from the same disciplines uh, spe or specializations or professional fields. And um, what they were, they were colleagues who sh uh, were sharing a, a common aspiration. And what they shared was a deep interest in and a commitment to uh, the utility of systems thinking and design action as a means to secure improvement and advancement in the human condition. And um, this common bond resulted in um, the Berkeley bubble, what I call the Berkeley bubble. And um, it has been um, internationally influential in, inside and outside of academia. So the master classes are sort of a, a continuation of some of the ideas um, that came up during uh, the Berkeley Bubbles uh, tenure and um, some continuing some of the conversations with uh, some of the major ideas, still with this notion of um, trying to secure um, improvement and progress in the human condition. So one of the things that uh, we need to do is to uh, begin to build the sort of distinctions and conjunctions um, that will uh, make a difference in the conversations that we have. We have to uh, have a better understanding of what different meanings are that we're bringing, you know, what different understandings we're bringing, and uh, to discover the things that we have in common. So, for instance, when uh, you read an article about design or you listen to somebody talking about design, invariably uh, they will have assumed that um, design, as they're using the term, is representative of a, a particular field. And trust me, this is a listing of some design fields. And um, there are many, many more and more coming on all the time. And essentially uh, what these fields are, are they are tactical approaches uh, to design. They're what people would call disciplines, design disciplines. And uh, one of the first things we need to understand when we're talking with one another is uh, what particular field are we assuming that uh, design represents. And um, in addition to that, there's this notion of strategically, when we're talking about design, uh, 
there are assumptions that people make uh, as well so that some people will talk about design, have talked about design, uh, still do, as a midpoint between uh, science and arts and humanities. And for instance, uh, my training, original training as a designer was in architecture. And what we were told uh, in school was that um, architecture was a midpoint between uh, science and the arts and the humanities. And they made us take classes then at university in both science and art. And interestingly enough, I'm not sure if they still do it or not, but uh, Stanford, in order for you to get a degree in design, you had to have a degree in a science and a degree in fine arts. And there was no sort of uh, specialization of a course for designers from science. You had to have actually uh, courses in solid science and the same way for the uh, arts. Um, another one uh, pop more popular here uh, in the last decade or so uh, came from uh, Apple and uh, Steve Jobs' uh, uh, business organization. And that was that uh, uh, Jobs said design was this intersection between technology and the arts and the humanities. And you're probably all familiar uh, with uh, his story that he took a course in calligraphy and that made sort of all the difference in the world when he started working with computers and designing computers so that there was this notion, this influence of um, the arts on the technology that he was working with. So there was a rather um, well-known um, professor who in um, 1959, I think, um, gave a lecture uh, at uh, University of Cambridge, the uh, Reed Lecture. And at that lecture, he said, or he stated, that there were these two cultures of inquiry that uh, were so different, so distinct, that they would never ever be able to talk to one another or have any kind of common ground or kind of common background. So he made a distinction between science as a culture of uh, inquiry and arts and humanities as a totally different kind of uh, culture of inquiry. And um, he published a book from that lecture and it's proven to be uh, controversial since uh, he first presented the ideas in 59, they still inform uh, a lot of debate in that. But anyhow, uh, the point here is that we can imagine that design is a third culture of inquiry. Now, that's not commonly accepted or understood, uh, but it can, a case can certainly be made that design is uh, its own culture of inquiry. Um, it has its own postulates, its own assertions, its own traditions. It has all of the sort of components of a design of, of an uh, inquiry um, that fits the same kind of approach as uh, C.P. Snow's uh, was making the case for science and the arts. The thinking, though, is that design actually is inclusive of aspects of science and inclusive of aspects of arts and humanities, that design is rational and disciplined as well as very creative and open, so that it has parts of both of those other traditions. So essentially, uh, make the case that design is a multi multicultural inquiry so that in uh, design inquiry what we want to uh, find out is what's true which is scientific research uh, what's real it's more um, akin to what system science does in its research and uh, what's good uh, humanities inquiry what's right humanities again what's aesthetic, arts, uh, and what would be ideal, and that's design inquiry, what would be prudent, 
uh, design inquiry again, what would be desirable, design inquiry, and most importantly, what ought to be made real, uh, design inquiry again. So design inquiry isn't a distinct sort of approach to inquiry. It is a multicultural inquiry, and that means that um, it has um, the notion of part of what it does, it, it determines uh, what's real. Uh, that's the assessment uh, approach to uh, inquiry, and it's context dependent. And the other, uh, or another uh, aspect is uh, what's true. And of course, that's research, scientific uh, research. Very much context independent. That means that we come up with things that are universally true and will stay true, stable over time, location, um, that it's fairly constant. The other one is that uh, we want to uh, find out what's ideal, what's, uh, what's aesthetic, what's good. We engage in search, and uh, it's part of an intentional uh, form of inquiry. And uh, finally, the fourth one is that we want to um, understand and, and find out what's prudent, ethical, and right, which is um, in part reflection and action and uh, uh, wise uh, action. It comes from intention, what's the outcome? That's what we're interested in. So that's a multicultural inquiry, which we can say that's what systemic design inquiry is, multicultural inquiry. So culture uh, has a variety of uh, understandings that people uh, assume, and one that we've just been through, uh, making the case for design of inquiry as a form of culture. Um, and culture is defined by its artifacts, artifacts of creative uh, activity. Um, it all co also, uh, culture can be a character of a, a living system, and it can be the uh, actual design of a social system. It can be considered as a, an emergent quality or the aggregate norms and habits, uh, beliefs, values, and customs of people, or it can be tied to geography. And of course, there are other uh, understandings of culture as well. But the one that we talked about um, and that we're going to be exploring quite a bit is this notion of uh, culture is a design of inquiry, how we go about engaging in uh, discovering what's real, what's true, what's ideal, and what's prudent. So one of the interesting things is that looking at um, uh, design uh, as a culture of inquiry is that uh, there's this notion of culture shock, and uh, it may be something that you've experienced before if you've uh, made a transition from one culture into another. So if you move to uh, another country or uh, another region in the world, and you've um, gone into a, a culture um, that's quite different from your own uh, that you had grown up with. Or if you are immersed into a different culture, for instance, if you've gone to visit to do some scholarship or if you want to do some consulting or something and you're immersed in a different culture, then you can often experience uh, what's called culture shock. And we won't go into uh, the steps in detail, but there are several steps um, of uh, uh, reaction that uh, uh, you will uh, experience. And uh, I've done that myself, gone through those steps to my surprise. Uh, they're sort of real. Uh, so anyway, to imagine you coming from whatever cultural background you have as a form of inquiry. So if you're a scientist or if you're an artist or if you're a musician, or if you're an author of literature, then you want to experience uh, systemic design as a culture if you want to move into it, 
or you just want to immer immerse yourself into it, you can imagine that you're going to experience some form of culture shock uh, as you go into it. And uh, it's not that that's a negative thing. It's just the reality of moving from one culture into another, whether it's a transition or an immersion. And there are different kinds of cultures uh, that ap appear in design itself. Uh, there's the culture of designing, the actors, uh, the individuals, the teams, the cohorts that are all part of uh, the agents of uh, designing. And then there is the design-friendly culture, the space that uh, you are in as a designer, which is a kind of a container or crucible and it includes the champions and protectors of what you're doing, what the design process is about, who you are as a designer, what you need to do. And the other one is that um, it's the cultural station point, the place, uh, the perspective, the stance you have, uh, the position you're in. So those are like three different kinds of uh, cultures that uh, exist in design culture itself, uh, three different just types, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, the place is, um, of course, what we're trying to do uh, here is to develop a place, uh, a station point that we can all together uh, have conversations in and that we can have discussions in and we can do some experiential learning and have some uh, applications so that the culture is, becomes then our place for a conversation, our, our space for conversation. And uh, to begin to pull in, identify the champions uh, who support us and the alliances that we need to be in uh, in order for uh, uh, systems design to be successful. And then, of course, how do we um, develop the, the actors? How, how do we create, uh, just for ourselves and for others, how do we create uh, competent systemic designers that can work together in teams and cohorts and uh, can uh, actually be a, a part of uh, a design process working for uh, clients and uh, stakeholders and others. So here in systemic design, one of the, the reasons that the, uh, we speak of systemics and design uh, together is that uh, systemics are the logics of design. There's a lot more to design, of course. Um, there's uh, aspects, aesthetics, and, uh, and ethics, and other things. But uh, most importantly, in this case, systemics are the logics of design. And that any progress in system science and other fields really add to the uh, credibility of uh, what designers are doing, and particularly systemic designers. And you can't actually uh, split systemics from design. It's sort of like uh, physicists cannot split uh, matter from energy. They're combined. They're, they, they're a combination. And uh, thus, in this case, uh, systemics and design are also combined. You can't separate them. It doesn't make sense to talk about design and not talk about systemics. So, Systemic designing, um, in this case, uh, it's not, uh, I guess, so well known with people, but um, there's this notion that in designing, you're actually bringing something into existence that didn't exist before, which is why the usual traditions of inquiry for uh, describing and explaining something uh, aren't necessarily sufficient in this case. But because when you bring something into existence, you're making it and you're not explaining or describing it as you would in science, for instance, but you're actually creating something. You're creating reality. So it's poesis. 
The other is that uh, poesis is in conjunction with what's called phronesis, which is wise action. And um, it's a type of wisdom um, that's practical or prudent action. And it shows good judgment and excellent of character. Now, both of these terms aren't necessarily like big words or any or academic words or anything. They're just words uh, for things that we don't talk about that much um, that aren't so common and that need to become more common and become more part of our conversation um, uh, in order to help us understand uh, more clearly what systemic design is about. So these aren't just two different aspects. They're actually conjunctions of one another. So it's making and taking wise action in combination. So we can say systemic design is a form of inquiry. It's thinking differently when set against a different world of background practices and trainment. And that means it's a hard concept uh, to um, understand immediately because it deals with um, things that aren't necessarily so apparent that we just assume it's sort of like uh, fish in water is an example that's used all the time. Fish don't understand or even see water. They don't understand that they're wet and what wetness means or anything. They're entrained in water, and so they can't see it. So um, systemic design is sort of entrained in a similar sort of element like water, like wetness, in that it's something that surrounds us and it uh, provides a kind of reality and meaning for what we're doing. And paradigms, um, if, you, if we think of this entrainment from that water-fish um, analogy, if we think of um, uh, paradigms, paradigms are a form of swimming. So we are assuming that we're in this whatever the media is, the, the water. We assume and we're in this water. We, we don't question it. It's just there. And our uh, uh, paradigms allow us to successfully navigate and maneuver uh, through that. And so paradigms are just a different way of swimming in the larger sort of um, uh, entrainment of the water or the liquids that we're in, the, the background um, that we're in. So part of the specifications for uh, putting these master classes together, conformance specifications, is that uh, they need to be inclusive, uh, complex, and holistic. So that um, the courses and systemic design itself needs to include broad design. It needs to not be narrowed, siloed, um, be brought into particular slices, um, silos of uh, reality. And we need it to be uh, complex and deep. And complex doesn't mean just uh, complicated. Uh, certainly, it doesn't mean just that there's a, a, a number of pieces and parts and, and there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, complex is very different. And it can be that um, we have to understand it as layered and it's in different sort of states. And so that it's, it's not just a simple uh, piece of a bunch of parts that are sort of related, which happens a, a lot when people are talking about uh, complexity, is they talk often about uh, numbers and aggregations of things. And the notion that um, uh, it's holistic, which is the systemic design piece that comes together, that it has an integrity of the aggregation itself, the way it's composed and brought together, that it's sufficient. It's not comprehensive. 
It just means that it's sufficient, it has its integrity, it has its own quality because of the nature of all the connections, interconnections, and relationships uh, that are in place. So this is just kind of a, a general uh, summary of what we've been talking about, that uh, it has to be uh, uh, a, a process, of the, the courses are a process of establishing um, the shared space for inquiry and um, that we can develop common ground uh, for our conversations and our work together, and that uh, we can begin to understand uh, what uh, systemic design education is all about, what systemic design practices are all about, and how we go about uh, preparing and practicing or engaging in practice uh, as systemic designers. So the reason uh, for these master classes, uh, beyond the establishment of just the, the uh, conversations, which is important in itself, is that eventually um, the point is to establish a formal venue, uh, a center for advanced systemic design, and within that center uh, to establish a systemic design flight school. Um, and the idea of um, using the term flight school comes from the actual um, sort of models that you use in uh, flight training. If I don't know if any of you are, uh, have your uh, uh, flight um, backgrounds and if you actually fly planes, but flight schools um, have this uh, great structure where they have a, a structure of ground school where you learn theory and you uh, understand uh, sort of the, the nature of the physics of flying, that sort of thing. And then you go through the notion of uh, instrument uh, instruction. You learn how, how to use tools and aids in uh, flying. <clears throat> and then you also do uh, simulations. So you go through simulation, you can simulate flight or flying, and um, then you actually have a process where you go with flight instructors who help coach you and uh, make a sort of uh, advises as you're going along. And before you go out as solo flying, uh, you go through those different stages. So it's a great model because people often say, well, you know, I don't want to just sit around and, and learn a bunch of theory. I don't want to just do a bunch of reading. I want to do stuff. So um, the obvious thing is in systemic design and flying is that because you've had a weekend workshop or you've had a, a boot camp or something, um, nobody's going to give you a key to the jet because you've had that brief uh, introduction. You're going to get... Uh, the permission to fly uh, because you've committed to and you've engaged with a sort of a multi-layered um, complex process of becoming uh, competent uh, to become a flyer. And the intention is to be inclusive of other master classes as we're going along um, that are going to be uh, uh, guided and navigated by other scholar practitioners in systemic designing related topics. So there will be 
uh, particular areas, people bringing in particular perspectives and approaches to different aspects of uh, being uh, systemic designers. So thank you uh, for your uh, time and attention. I appreciate your interest and uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, uh, your presence in uh, the subsequent courses now that we're going to be uh, offering uh, in preparation for the development of the center and uh, the flight school. And watch for um, the other scholar practitioners that are going to make, be making presentations as well and, and doing master classes. We're all going to become a part of um, that larger sort of notion of the center and um, out of a, a certain group, then we will get um, those who can actually begin to help um, be the, the navigators, guides for um, the scholar practitioners, the, the systemic designers that are just becoming, uh, or just be beginning to develop as uh, professionals. So we'll actually be uh, developing staff as well as potential students uh, for uh, further training. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much.